Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. I am Paul, U.S. Army combat veteran, and today we are going to be taking a look at, well, one of the most interesting comparisons that a lot of people have been making about the latest phase in the war in Ukraine, and specifically Russia's tactics and their tactical and strategic objectives. And we're going to answer the question, are the Russians trying to recreate Stalingrad? Well, let's get into it. So first off, is it even is it even a, a Paul video if I don't cover some crazy weapon system? I feel like I have an obligation to. This is some of the latest fighting from Mikolaev Oblast. Um, I don't know why I have the headphones on, honestly. There's not really any benefit to it, right? You can hear there. This is just a crazy missile system. I mean, look at this. You can't have yeah, a, a soul net spec. I mean, I've I've just rarely seen missile systems that pack this big a punch i mean you can see the explosion radius the radius of the actual explosion and i'm just also shocked at the short range i guess i've seen mlrs fire but i've never seen a shot like this now what's fascinating is that this is obviously russian propaganda um as as much of the footage released is right ministries of defense do a good job of controlling what does get out and doesn't get out um to the viewing public um and obviously a weapon this like with this big a punch is like pretty scary um and this is meant to be extremely shocking but um this is said to be near nikolaev it's extremely short range and it's i guess it's the same shot over and over again um they call it a flamethrower it's it's not it's this is this is just a regular like missile system maybe it's thermobaric but that may also just be how how the explosion is traveling through the air in these specific particular conditions um but the point is obviously the russians are very publicly going to town uh pushing hard in regions like Mikolaev. let's take a look at the strategic situation we haven't actually done this in a while this is kind of a live ukrainian update map which is pretty good you can see Mikolaev is right down here uh so this is probably it looked like it was on the outskirts of the city so my guess would be it's probably one of these instances that we're seeing if it's indeed accurately tagged again we don't really see other supporting forces on the Russian or Ukrainian side. So it remains to be seen. But what's important is Russians probably aspiring to capture this air base here, right? The ability to launch uh, fighter aircraft and is always seen as, as pretty beneficial, especially when you're talking about, you could see one, two, three, four airports in the Mikolaev area. So even if you have m multiple planes running sorties, if you can hold more airports, you have less crowding, less, uh, more room to do refueling operations. You have access to hangars, you have access to a lot. So that could be why they could also just be sort of trying to hold the Ukrainians back using uh, their limited resources as efficiently as possible. And I know there's a lot of debate over just how limited the Russian resources are, but I think it's pretty clear from all the data we've seen and from this data here, right, that the primary fighting is in this area here, right, in what's the DNR, the, the, what Russia considers the DNR LNR. So let's talk real quick. What does Russia consider its DNR and LNR? Well, let's pop this in here. Let me make sure you guys can see that. Okay. So yeah, this is obviously we've got Luhansk. I, I'm so sorry about my terrible pronunciation. Donetsk, Mariupol. But basically it considers the DNR and LNR to be just run due north of Mariupol. Run this straight line here and you've pretty much captured it, right? So what does that look like here? Well, here's Mariupol and here... A straight line due north and you've pretty much got it so the only holdout from russia liberating the dnr lnr is this region right here and here is where i think they are trying to recreate stalingrad and not by accident right uh you know the russians when they look at at their tactics and strategies of warfare they're gonna go back to the times and see what worked uh there's a lot of small unit tactics that the U.S. forces rely on that are taken straight from 
of the Vietnam. In fact, the five paragraph operations order, the core planning document of the U.S. military, U.S. Army on every single level, literally from a combat patrol all the way to the invasion of a country is done using the five paragraph operations order. And that originated before World War II. Literally D-Day was, you can view the D-Day op board. And it's actually considered pretty funny because modern operations orders are hundreds of pages long with dozens and dozens of annexes. Uh, the D-Day operations order, the largest uh, coordinated um, uh, what, amphibious invasion in history, 12 pages. That's it. That was what had to be done. But when you're at the general level, you don't have the ability to micromanage beyond that. Anyway, pretty fun fact. Um, but this isn't the World War II battle we're talking about. We are talking about Stalingrad, and we're talking about particularly what's called the cauldron. So let's take a look here. You can see that the Russians, Russian forces, have pushed out in sort of a bubble on this side and here. And when we zoom in, we see that there's nothing that looks especially noteworthy about this terrain. Now, I want to point out that these are not like World War I style, like there's not trench lines all through here. You're going to see forces uh, traveling along the road. So like there's probably Russian forces here, probably Russian forces uh, here, Russian forces controlling this road and this road, and probably like this road and key town here. And then, of course, the front line just automatically draws itself. There's no reason to seize uh, territory that your enemy can't really traverse quickly, you can't really traverse quickly, and doesn't have any good real strategic value. But you can see this isn't prob this probably isn't an accident of the battlefield. Russia has very deliberately gone out and around these major urban areas. You can see in the map that this is largely a kind of rural or suburban hinterland, and these are the major urban areas here see major airports i mean you can just you can just look you can see it's highly developed it's all along this river here uh centered along this uh like maybe that's luhansk lechansk and so why would the russians seize a bunch of low value hinterlands when they should be trying to seize this high value urban areas and they're doing the same thing up here you can see while there's some anchor anchor cities here uh this is still i mean look you can see on the map this is swampland these these uh these hashed water lines denote a, a swamp area why would the russians push forward to hold a swamp right here's more look at look at all this this has no strategic value but you can see the russians very deliberately have pushed into this swamp leaving this city this urban this whole urban stretch unoccupied what is the idea here? Well, you can see this is almost a play-by-play -play recreation of the Battle of Stalingrad. Let us let me show you what I mean. So here is a sort of like the, the pre-Battle of Stalingrad, right? What happened is the German and, and uh, primarily German, but also Romanian armed forces pushed deep into Russia and finally encountered the Red Army at Stalingrad, where they were able to be blunted. Their forward momentum was finally stopped at Stalingrad. And for a time, it was a neutral battle, right? It was both sides were evenly matched. But slowly, the Russians proved able to flank around the Don River. You can see here, uh, let's, there we go. Let's see, can you see? There you go. You can see here, there's a whole bunch of mechanized and conventional forces that flanked around the north side and around the south side of the German army. Now, important to note that German Army Group B, its flanks were protected by Romanians. And it's worth noting because the Romanian armed forces just weren't at the same level of the German armed forces. They were inex less experienced, less trained, less funded. So it meant that while fighting the elite German army, the 6th and 4th, in Stalingrad was would have been an extremely difficult and was proven to be an extremely brutal battle, the Russian armed forces realized they had control 
of the Volga. The Germans were not going to cross the Volga. It was too slow, too complicated, too difficult to do so. And so instead, the Red Army said, you know what? We are just going to go around and we're going to attack the Germans where they're weak, not where they're strong and prepared to defend. And that was their Romanian army allies. So they flanked around, they pushed through the Romanians, pushed them out, and finally cut off the 6th and 4th armies from the larger army group B, in the process doing a lot of damage to the Romanian armed forces. Now let's see what happened after they had completed their encirclement. You could see here, the German 6th and 4th armies were consolidated, trapped, pinned against the Volga, and surrounded by Soviet forces, who, here's the thing, you could see there was only two airports that they had access to, and the German high command, their plan, right, was actually, there's airport one, airport two, German high command's plan was to try to resupply the entire 6th army via aircraft, which was not even theoretically possible. Even if every aircraft was to fly on the with the at the maximum limit of missions it could possibly fly, it you just had a reality that you're talking about tens of thousands of soldiers who need just to just the 300 calories to survive and sustain life is tons and tons of food a day, and you can't get that via aircraft. Germany at this time didn't really have heavy lift transport aircraft. And even if they did, it just would not have been possible to land enough aircraft at these sites to, uh, at these two airports, unload them, turn them around, and fly them back out. Just wasn't possible. So the, what you had is the sixth army was slowly starved not proverbially, though they were proverbially starved. Their tanks were starved of fuel, for example. Their artillery starved of uh, rounds. But they were also literally starved. Uh, their soldiers literally ran out of food. And the longer it went on, the more hopeless the situation became, the easier it became for the Soviets to achieve victory. So that by the time... So the fighting that took place was minimal, right? It was absolutely minimal. Uh, it was artillery attacks. It would have looked more like, again, the fighting around here. Just routine sort of operations trying to keep the 6th Army from being able to uh, lower their combat posture. And finally, after weeks and weeks of, of limited food, running themselves out of ammunition, uh, defending constant harassing attacks, the 6th Army wasn't in a position where it could defend itself from anything. And the Soviets achieved most of their strategic effects without actually engaging in a direct push on the enemy, right? They literally, by just cutting them off, and they also had some help from weather, it's worth noting. The Russian winter is brutal, and trying to, for many, many days and weeks, aircraft couldn't even fly into Stalingrad uh, from German air bases because the weather just wouldn't allow it. So, all this to say that if you can't beat them in a stand-up fight, you can always just starve them out. This, I mean, this actually dates back to the Middle Ages, uh, siege warfare, and you had these competitions between a castle's ability to basically stockpile food and a um, invading army's ability to sustain a campaign financially and logistically uh, in an effort to take different strategic castles. So this sort of medieval style of warfare was brought back in during what actually was called Operation Uranus. That's, uh, you can see up here, that's the name of this GIF. Um, that was the Soviet encirclement of the sixth and fourth armies so do i think the russians are trying to recreate this i think it, it absolutely is the case why because they we know we looked on the map we found that this little chunk right here is sort of in a lot of ways the missing piece of the russians completing what they've now said you know, they've, they've sort of changed their objective and claimed that all along their goal was to seize the DNR and LNR from Ukraine 
And you can see you run this line straight up through Mariupol, and this is kind of the last area holding out. So the Russians really, really would want to be able to lock this cauldron, is what they called it in Stalingrad, lock this cauldron up and allow the remaining Ukrainian forces to lose most of their combat power through simple logistical attrition. Now, as we've seen in Mariupol, this it, it's not World War II. Um, small numbers of soldiers with even limited resupply can cause a lot of problems for attackers. And the ability to isolate uh, defenders from air support is actually pretty is not like it was in the second world war uh in fact even after <laughs> even just a few years after world war ii uh the soviets decided they were going to do the peacetime version of the uh of the cauldron with the berlin uh, the erection of the berlin wall and the u.s uh, where they basically cut off berlin from the rest of germany state and the uh, with no ability to get food, and their goal was to have Berlin um, yield and join the uh, Russian-backed East Germany. But the U.S. proved that no, with the right amount of resources and heavy lift aircraft, and obviously not being engaged in combat, they were able to resupply the entire city of Berlin uh, through an entire winter, in fact. And food, coal, Everything it needed was pushed through the Berlin airlift. It was a massive effort, but it proved that even with just five or six years of advanced aircraft advancements, better logistical planning, and more resources that the Germans really didn't have because they were fighting wars elsewhere, uh, you could in fact sustain an isolated pocket of people for a, indefinitely using aircraft. So even if this were to get cut off, it's not clear that they would have a Stalingrad-like situation where they were able to bleed out the defenders. Uh, as we've seen, Russians don't really control the air. Uh, the Ukrainians are able and willing to efficiently resupply their defending forces, uh, especially on the defense, right? The Ukrainians don't need, to, for example, tons and tons of, of fuel. They don't really aren't that mechanized, especially on the defense, um, and especially in urban warfare. So it's not clear to me that even if they were to complete their encirclement Stalingrad style, that they would be able to successfully uh, starve out the Ukrainian defenders. Now, guys, I want to take a real quick sec and just talk. I have, if you guys haven't noticed in the last 18 months, my channel has blown up. I've gotten over 20 million views on all my channels. And I have actually have four times now monetized YouTube channels. So I have sort of a method for how to grow and expand channels. And I've learned a lot of lessons. And I've taken all of it, put it into a single masterclass. Uh, the link is in the description. It's 50% off. And it's already cheaper than like any other YouTuber's um, masterclass. Because again, my target audience is like I am, like I was. I was a regular guy working a day job who wanted to start YouTube on the side and all I had was a webcam and a headset and knowledge. And so if you're like one of those people who says, hey, I have this knowledge, I have these opinions, I wanna share it, um, but I don't know how to be successful on YouTube, that's who I've designed the course for. And I'm so sure it'll work actually that if you take the course and in six months of putting content on YouTube, you haven't made back the tuition, I'll refund your money. So seriously, take a look in the, the, the Take a look in the description. You, there's no risk to you, um, and it would mean a lot to me. Um, plus, to see you guys succeed, especially when you're successful, right? Let, send, send me a message. I want to know. You know, I want to. I want to be proud of my students. Anyway, okay. So, what would they have to do to close off the cauldron? Well, here's the nice thing. The nice thing for them is that uh, there's not a lot here. There's a couple of small towns they'd have to seize, and the the entire area, you can see here, this is one mile, so we're talking about maybe 10 miles of area to cover. So, but 
as we know, rural seizing rural territory, uh, it can be easy and hard at the same time. And I say that because look at all of these sort of undrivable, swampy, open areas. Now, we know that Russian tanks and vehicles, right, they're primarily an armored force, they need to push down these roads. So to seize this area, you basically are going to have to push down pretty much this main road here, uh, this main road here, and I imagine there's some smaller unmarked roads, but that's what you're going to have to push down. So it's sort of like you having a heart attack. The danger is when you're, you don't have enough blood supply to your heart, and even if you have enough blood, if it's trying to get to your heart through little narrow arteries that are narrower than ever before, well, it, can, it means that even small problems can create huge shortages. So in a way, it's almost easier to push through a city where you can always turn and find a different route. Pushing into these rural areas, you have no choice but to fight tooth and nail. It's no secret. Once you start driving down this rural road, just like the rural roads in every country, once you start driving down these rural roads, people know if they see you driving here, and we'll get this nice and big. If they see you driving here, you have no choice. You have nowhere you can turn off until you get here. So what does that mean? Well, it means that you can be ambushed a lot. And so the Russians actually probably have their work cut out for them. Especially you look here and you can see they're pushed right along to this river's edge. So chances are they're going to have to do a pretty hairy uh, river crossing, which if you've seen my previous videos, you know, it's also kind of tough for them. So this is a long way from being almost encircled. Uh, but I think it's the larger Russian objective. And I suspect that if they're able to do so and are able to close off and seize this uh, urban area here, this kind of urban strip along the, I think it's the Don, I can't speak Cyrillic, I don't know. Um, but if they could seize this strip along this uh, river here, they will probably declare victory. So anyway, guys, thanks so much for joining me. Um, if you guys want some breakdowns of combat videos that are just a little too spicy for YouTube, you want to check out the Patreon. Link is in the description. Thanks so much to my Lieutenant Tier patrons. I'll see you in the next one.